Hi everyone, today I'm here with Dr. Mardash, a uh, associate clinical professor of pediatrics at UC Davis Health and a uh, clinical and biochemical geneticist. So thank you, Dr. Mardash, for being a part of this interview. Oh, my pleasure. What is clinical and biochemical genetics and um, what are the most common cases you see in a day? All right, well, our specialty, uh, which now is considered to be a full medical specialty, and it wasn't so when the time when I was in training. At that time, I had to to do a, another specialty, and I'm a pediatrician too, for that reason. But today, this is considered a full medical specialty since the middle of the 90s. And so what we do is we deal with all the genomics, and uh, which means the genetic basis of human disease and heredity. And so um, our profession has gone from just being laboratory based and very uh, you know uh, obscure to be to become a very important part of most medical specialties today because of course we humans are genes and our environment and so uh, clinical genetics has to do with many 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 different aspects where genes are involved with and uh, that's why I said that we pretty much nowadays involve ourselves in in situations from cancer uh, to developing fetuses to uh, rare cardiac or neurological disorders, uh, endocrinological problems. I mean, there's a, it's a long range, and that's why we have now become a little sub-specialized in different aspects of the clinical genetics because it would be a little much for a single person to. To do Clinical genetics is a fellowship that you do after, is it just pediatrics or could it be other specialties as well? Well, nowadays, because it's a full specialty, mm -hmm. after you graduate from med school, mm -hmm. you can choose to go into genetics. Okay. And so it's a clinical specialty. Did you know that? No, I, I, know I thought that? it was just a fellowship. No, no, no. When, when we do clinical genetics, which is um, a, generally a two or three year uh, residency, mm -hmm. uh, then you can go into different areas of genetics. And for, in my case, I went into biochemical genetics, which is the metabolic part of genetics, and I did a sub-specialization in that or a fellowship. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other people go into molecular genetics and uh, cytogenetics and different parts of of, um, yeah, of genetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so genetics is a, a residency program that you can get into after medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned things like molecular or cytogenetics. What other subspecialties are there of uh, genetics that you can do? Well, you know, we have people nowadays that are in any other specialty because in the past you needed to have other medical, clinical specializations. So, you know, people that are internees and they have different endocrinologies uh, or ophthalmologies, um, nephrologies. I mean, there's, there's different people in, in regular adult medicine. And, and there's other geneticists that work more in the cancer area, more hemato-oncology, uh, because this is very strong. Uh, all the, the bases of cancer have a lot to do with genes. And, and so they specialize more in that area. And then there's a large group of us who work in the pediatric um, group um, because um, it makes, you know, to help with the diagnosis of kids that are uh, born with different genetic conditions. And there's another uh, large portion which is all related to prenatal. Uh, from the conception, even, you know, before conception, doing diagnosis. Uh, and that's where the cytogenesis and cytomolecular genesis uh, have a lot to do. To the counseling of couples that are at risk for genetic disease because either one of them has a condition or because there's family history of a condition that is known to be segregating in, in the family. And so the, there are some geneticists that are gynecobstetricians that specialize in that area of prenatal, the prenatal genetics. Mm -hmm. What are the most common cases you usually see in, uh, in your practice? Yeah, well, because um, I'm, a, I'm a bit specialized, mm -hmm. um, I tend to have 
a, a clinic, for example, today that is more specialized into different areas. And so today we were seeing cardiac clinic, mm -hmm. and that means that patients that have cardiac problems, both children and adults, come to see a geneticist so that we investigate uh, if there is a, a suggestion that this is a familial or inherited form of cardiac disease. And so we do that. Some other days you know, we will see uh, patients with neurological conditions. The neurogenomics is a, is a large area because there is uh, a lot that is being done nowadays with all these movement disorders and Parkinson, Alzheimer's, and there is a lot of uh, work going on that. And we finally have started to apply this to the clinical setting. And so uh, we see patients with different disorders, many of them children, but also adults. So that's one of the things that I would say of genetics, that you're going to see the whole spectrum of humans. You know, you don't, most times, depending on what the uh, uh, specialization you take, but generally you deal with patients from when they're, before they're born until, you know, they're old, mm -hmm. old patients. So I say, it is very interesting. So I think that my days are full of many, many different cases. And um, I wouldn't, you know, generally I know what the patients are going to be because we, we have the schedules prepared. But, but the, generally there's different aspects that we investigate when they come about their families, uh, about their own medical history. And uh, so they become very, very interesting uh, um, consultations. And an important thing is that a geneticist has, a, generally in most places, we have a full hour to evaluate a patient. In other specialties, you have to see the patient, and examine the patient, and do their recommendations 15 minutes and write a note, correct? <laughs> well, we do all of that because I examine most of the patients myself, but, uh, but we have a little more time to be able to go through this because there's a lot of um, information that needs to be gathered to be able to do a good counseling session. Okay, so what's a typical day in your life like from when you come in to when you leave? And what hours do you... Uh, yeah, well, you we work, work the same as any, any other people. Um, we usually start uh, the day at 8 in the morning and we have a session, a clinical session in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I'm generally here from eight to five or something like that, seeing the patients. We have uh, here at the Mind Institute, this is a beautiful, beautiful setup. The clinic is very kid friendly. And sometimes the adults who come here to <laughs> find that they feel un unusual because this is a very nice setup. And, and so we, we have a played area and, and the patients come they are received by the nurses the same as in any other medical specialty. They get their viral signs, they get all their measurements, everything, and then the, um, they go into our rooms and we spend the time with them. And uh, I, I, I would say that at the end of the day, generally when I have clinic, I feel satisfied but very tired because it is very complex. You know, we're dealing with a lot of um, human situations and many times we deal with diseases and you know passing a condition to your child or your child has a, a bad condition or an adult who has been diagnosed with a condition that probably is not going to be treatable so this is it's, it's a complex thing but very interesting from the perspective that you can do a lot of help and information to this to these families mm -hmm. And do you work Monday through Friday? Is there call days or? Um, well, here we uh, each of uh, each of us in our group have different schedules. We don't work every day in the clinics. Uh, we have different uh, number uh, number of clinics. Each of us, me, I have three days that I do clinics the whole day, and then the other t uh, two days there's all the different academic uh, and scholar activities that we do because we are all faculty here. And uh, um, it varies, as I said, with the type of practice that you have. You know, some, some people are more involved in the clinical area. Some others are more involved in research, clinical, clinical or I wouldn't say basic research because we don't do that. We are a clinical specialty, but many of us also uh, do clinical research because there is a lot of potential and new therapies that are coming 
when I trained, there was nothing. I mean, if you had, in, especially in metabolic conditions, which is the biochemical part that I do, there was nothing to be offered. You know, we would make a diagnosis, then molecular technology improved, we were able to look at genes better, uh, but we didn't have anything to offer. But uh, in the 90s, and definitely in the 2000s, uh, new technology allowed the development of uh, enzymes to, to do enzymes replacement, and nowadays there's a lot of bioengineered therapies that are done based on molecular and genomic data. So it is a very interesting field in that sense. And so there's a lot of opportunity for those who want to do clinical research to get involved with that. And that's what we do here because we are an academic center and so, you know, there's a lot of involvement by different people do more or less, but, but there's always that involvement with, with research and investigation. Okay, so I was going to ask um, if there are opportunities to do things in, medic in clinical genetics besides clinical work, and it seems like a lot of um, you and your colleagues do. Is that just for academic centers that you're able to do research and other things like that, or is that also true in like private practice? I would say in private practice, I, I, I practiced before I came to the mine for many years in an HMO setting, and I was doing clinical research all the time that mm -hmm. I, I was there uh, because of the uh, development of new uh, therapies and so nowadays um, industry is sponsoring and we are collaborating with industry to be able to develop all these therapies and so uh, we get involved with that so that our patients have the benefit of receiving these therapies even before they are approved and we help with the approval process so that then they become available to all of them. And so I said I was doing that in the private setting too. And of course here is more because that's part of what we do here. You know, we we are we are an academic institution, so that's definitely what we do. That we dedicated part of our work to do that advancement of knowledge and, and the use of different therapies. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of employment types and practice settings are a clinical geneticist employed in? Is it mostly like bigger groups like this is a trend nowadays? Obviously there's academics um, which you're mm -hmm. part of. Um, are there clinicians who just do like completely independent solo practice or like locum tenens work and things like that? I think that that's not um, generally what a geneticist, a clinical geneticist would do. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is because this is a, a specialty that requires uh, molecular data and testing. And so you could be a private uh, person and you know have your own uh, office, uh, but um, I, I think that most of us uh, tend to work in groups, either in private practice, in HMOs, or, uh, or a group, a private group, many of the cancer-related groups, or the prenatal and perinatal uh, specialists like to have geneticists as part of their groups. So generally either in the academic or in the private sector, but uh, generally as a group, I would say. Uh, although you can also you know, have your solo practice, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of keeping up with the information, and that's why, at least for me, it's easier to be in a group because you hear things, we review cases, this is information that is coming on a monthly basis. You know, it's amazing the amount of information and there's no way for us to keep it all. It's, there's no much time for us to be updated if you just read stuff. There's no time for that. So I think that being in a, in a setup where people are working in different areas allows you to get information and, and be very, you know, updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're a pediatrician and a geneticist, right? Yes. Uh, what made you decide on pediatrics and uh, what made you decide on genetics? Well, to tell you the truth, when I did my residency in peds, I did this in New York, and uh, I, I really had never heard of genetics. That I came from Colombia in South America, and I came here to do my training, and I'm doing pediatrics, and there was this professor who uh, was... Uh, part of our faculty. And so he would come and would take the, the residence on rounds. And uh, he was the one who showed me how interesting this was and how many of the different cases that we had 
in different specialties, they all have a little bit of genetics. And so that's how I started getting interested into it. Mm -hmm. um, later on, when I decided to become a geneticist, I wanted to be a, cardia, a cardiologist, you know, pediatric cardiologist. But then I decided, well, this is, sounds much more interesting. And uh, I'm very happy that I, I made that decision. Uh, but then the same professor, you know, you always find somebody in your life, people that you don't, don't it's not even from your family, correct? <laughs> but people that are good counselors uh, was the one who advised me to go into biochemical genetics because at that time, not many people wanted to do that because biochemical sounds like terrible, you know, and the concept of biochemical didn't sound clinical. And so there weren't many clinicians doing that. And, and so I, I decided to... to to take that as my subspecialty. And of course, it's very clinical, uh, that part is, because metabolic disorders are genetic disorders, but that have manifestations and, and com many, many complications throughout life. And so you definitely need a clinician who understands the condition to work with them. And so that became you know, my priority uh, subspecialization at that time. I did PEDS for a while until uh, I was too busy with biochemical, and so there was not really time to keep up with, you know, updates in the pediatric area because pediatrics is also a full business uh, residency, correct? Our uh, specialty. So at some point I said, okay, I'm going to have to let go of PEDS for now so that I can become more completely a clinical and biochemical genetics. Uh, how is the genetics lifestyle different from that of other specialties? You mentioned like yeah. you have more time with patients and you have like more of like, an like an eight to five as opposed to like like yeah. like weird hours. Well, one big difference is that we don't have to be in hospital on call. We are on call, and all of us, you know, we take our um, weeks weeks of on call. We divide among us. And so there's always one of us who is ready to respond to the consultations that we go and we do in the hospital. And uh, there is a very, like in, in, a, in this hospital, it, there are very interesting cases. So we are, we are always doing interesting consultations, but you don't have to be in the house. So, you know, by the end of the day, you do your clinic and you go home. And you need to be available to go and do your consultations, which we really can do whenever we can. You know, it doesn't have to be at any specific time. I think that's a big difference from the other colleagues, in the sense that we are not on call with fourth night. Or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little different, uh, and it's a big plus in general. So our lives are busy uh, because mainly the reporting. You know, the um, electronic medical records made this very complicated work in this, not, not the clinical part, it's great to have the information available, that, that helped a lot. But, you know, every one of these cases, we have to write a report, and we spend, we have an hour, but we spend that hour with the patient, and then you have to write those reports, and so that is time consuming, time consuming, so, you know, we spend a good man, amount of time writing those reports. We have developed templates and we have, we are, we are okay with the use of EMR, but still there's too many aspects, you know, to, to make it very simple. It's not, it's not like checking in some specialties, you can see a patient in 15 minutes, but you just check, 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 normal, normal, and whatever it is not, you, you put, correct? Well, here's the different, you have to talk about the families, you have to talk about all the, the clinical history, you have to talk about all the presenting symptoms, you have to make an assessment of what, what is the best, uh, you know, differential diagnosis and what type of workup you are going to recommend. So, thanks time. Mm -hmm. time to do that. So that's probably one of the challenges. What's the most challenging aspect of uh, being a geneticist? I would say keeping up with information. I just came, I was in the American College of Medical Genetics <coughs> meeting, and uh, you know, there's thousands of people, and we have all this busy, busy schedule, and there's so much information, and they have all these parallel sessions, and I wanted to go to all of them so I can get an idea, but you know, I had to choose one of the six sessions because there's not 
time to do more. And, um, and so you always feel like you, you don't know the latest. Because sincerely, this is like every month there's new information coming. And you know, I try and read as much as I can, but um, we have full days and you know, it's a limited amount. And, and I usually do it in the areas that are more focused on. And so that I think is a challenge, keeping up with all the information. Uh, and that's why we all go to meetings and we, we do hear uh, sessions where uh, there's lectures and there's always uh, an active um, scholar activity because of that, because otherwise, you know, how are you going to keep up <laughs> with the information? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's how you keep up on the literature, like in an academic setting. How do private uh, physicians tend to do that? Is it mostly just through like reading journal articles and No, meetings? they do the same, I would say. Mm -hmm. Private physicians go and participate in the meetings and, and they're all, most of the private uh, colleagues I know are affiliated with some academic institution, even though they're not part of them. Mm -hmm. And they go uh, weekly to their uh, lectures and, and run rounds and things like that because uh, otherwise it would be very difficult. And uh, of course, we all go to two or three meetings a year uh, because that's, there's no any other way to, to keep it up. <laughs> yes. Okay, and what's the most uh, rewarding aspect of being a geneticist? Well, I, this is a specialty that allows you to really connect with your patient. It is um, a situation where you cry with them, you hug them, they hug you, and you know, I find that that is very rewarding. And when you're able to explain to them what does the genetic information really mean in their lives, because there's so much this information, you know, they're seeing in the TVs that, oh, genetics can tell you where you're going to go, what diseases you're going to have, when you're going to die, and that is not true. And so people have a misconception. And so you explain to them, and they tell you, Thank you very much. You know, I, you, you, you explain very well. I understand, and that's very rewarding. So I think it's that connection, you know, with patient. And as I said many times, they they're difficult situations. A couple whose child is going to die with some condition that is incredible. Yet they appreciate that, that you know somebody took the time to explain, to to connect them with other sources of information and. You know, we do a lot of that, it's connecting with others, and especially now in social media, there's a group of everything, of different conditions, and so we, we help them getting connected and, and answering questions. And, and so I think that that human, human connection, I, I find it excellent. Any misconceptions besides, you mentioned um, some misconceptions patients have, do people have misconceptions about the specialty? Well, I think that they mis not real misconceptions, I would say, is mis lack of information. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how you see it, but um, in my times, uh, a geneticist was somebody in a laboratory doing basic research. And it's funny because, uh, you know, at the beginning of my career, I would say, I'm a geneticist. And nobody knew what that was. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> now I'm, I say, when they ask me what you do, I say, I'm a geneticist. Oh, okay, everybody knows. You know, and, and that thing started with the OJ uh, situation. Remember, they talk about DNA. That was in the 80s, correct? Suddenly, everybody knows what DNA is, but before they did. So when it comes to the, the medical student who wants to figure out what to do, I think we things like like this, and that's why I'm talking with you because I think that we need to give you the different uh, aspect of the professional career in, in genetics. You know, it's it's very exciting. It's a it's an exciting field. You can have contacts with all type of different patients. It is pan ethnic. It doesn't you know it's, you can be super specialized, but you really serve anyone that needs the services. Uh, there is interesting new things happening every day and because of the globalization we have access to all type of information today uh, genetics is at, at the advance of using telecommunications and this is only been in the last decade i have to tell you because at the beginning we were we were very slow at taking 
all this telecommunication revolution, but today we have fantastic databases, fantastic sources of information so that we can search on any type of genomic variance, what it means or what, what has happened to other patients. And so we have an excellent source of information to educate our patients and to figure out our cases. And then the, the molecular technology is fantastic to do diagnosis. And nowadays with a whole genome and whole exome sequencing, we are diagnosing cases that in the past were those diagnostic odysseys with Nobody could figure out what it was, but well, now we know. And so that makes uh, a, a big, you know, complements this. And to top all of this, biotechnology is allowing now, it's a big promise, you know, to have gene therapy. I think this is going to happen. I mean, not immediately, but there is the tools to, to move into that era where we can start modifying genes to improve somebody's health. So, so, it's very exciting, and if anything, your generation, this is going to be even better because in my generation, you know, when I started, as I said, we had nothing to offer. Now I'm happy to be able to offer a little more, but definitely this is uh, this is a specialty of the future, and is it especially that it's going to permeate every single area of medicine. No doubts. So you mentioned uh, gene therapy. What big advances do you see in the next few decades? Is it going to be mostly developments in things like gene therapy, or are there any other big things in genetics that are coming? I think that the, the main focus is today uh, trying to modify, not necessarily gene therapy, which I take as you take a gene that is defective, you insert the correct gene, correct with different modalities, and you change that problem. Uh, but also using genomic information because you know we have some therapies where we just bypass the defect and you know they use some some bridge there that bypasses the defect or you use some uh, activators that uh, improve the activity of other components of that group because you know genes work in, in complexes they don't work alone and so there's a lot of modifications and and manipulation and epigenomic changes that you can do to improve somebody's health. So if you include all of that, I, 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 mean, I don't know if that all of that is called gene therapy, but if, you, if we think of it as any changes to a person's DNA that would improve their health, yes, that's, that's, what's, that's the future. We're doing it with the, the cancer, which has been the big dilemma. Despite all this technology, we haven't been able to figure out where is the, what is the cause of it. But there's a lot being done on, on therapy. And when you talk about immunotherapy, for example, it's genetically based. You know, all of that has genetics at its base. And so it's very exciting. There's a lot of things that are going to come in the, in the improving human's health uh, by uh, changing. The DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now moving on to the finances, we talked a little bit about employment types. Uh, how well are genetics compensated relatively and compared to other specialties? Uh, we are an American, we are considered a specialty. So when I started and I was a pediatrician, uh, I was being remunerated as a pediatrician, which was uh, you know, in this private stage, correct? And so at some point in the 90s, we became a specialty. And so now we have uh, a higher degree of compensation. I wouldn't say that we are the level of the surgeon, of course, um, no, no there yet. Um, but we are, uh, I would say, I, no, I don't have numbers to tell you, but I would say that we are at the level of the majority of other pediatric subspecialties. Here at uh, Davis, we still belong to the Department of Pediatrics. We are a division of the Department of Pediatrics. But in other centers that I worked, also the uh, genetics, is, uh, the genetic department is a is an independent department. So it, it depends, you know, where you work. Uh, there are areas of prenatal, uh, all the reproductive uh, medicine where geneticists are involved. That uh, they have a lot of money there to do this type of thing. So, and then there's industry. Uh, industry is is actually. Um, when I when I was trained, we didn't look at industry, you know, we don't want them to get involved with us because biases and things. But 
today, uh, the Genesis, uh, as a profession, has decided to join forces with the industry because we decided that's the best way that therapy is going to be advanced. And so today, the majority of new uh, biotechnological discoveries and applications are, are done by clinicians in academic centers or private centers working with industry. So um, some of the, the people that work in industry maybe have a better remuneration, but, uh, you know, it depends. It depends on what um, type of practice you want to have. If you want to be more in a clinical setup, I would say you are at the level of any other specialty. And if you are uh, more interested in technology, then you, you could work as a clinician in industry because they always require clinical consultants when they, mm -hmm. they're doing their work. Okay, so if someone's trying to maximize their income or increase it in, as a geneticist, um, you'd recommend they go into like industry or um, maybe like a, a very specific yeah. area of uh, genetics? Well, yeah, but it depends because I wouldn't want to be in industry, you know, because then I don't have my patients, like the contact with patients. It's a different type of work. Um, and so I don't, I don't think I could do that. I, I have worked with many uh, companies that uh, have sponsored the clinical research that we've done through the years and we continue to do, but um, I think to me it's much more satisfying my connection with the patients and my work as a clinician. So, I mean, what you have to do is figure out if you want to go into academia or whether you want to go into private practice. It has plus and minus. And there is a big difference in remuneration and academia being lower than in private practice, of course. Uh, but then you don't have the other component of, uh, you know, this other activity. And so it depends on what the person wants to do. But uh, many high potentials for uh, genetic workup in the future. Okay, and how would you recommend a uh, med student plan to uh, manage their finance as well as a new doctor? Ah, okay. You mean any, any, any advice? advice? <laughs> well, any advice on like what, what we should do at, like when we graduate, um, maybe start like after residency or something? Well, I would say that you want to uh, think of not just you graduated and you need to start immediately paying loans. What you want to think is you're going to have 35, 40 years of a career in medicine and you want to go for that. You want to build that because definitely as time passes, you're very qualified, you get more experience, and you can, you know, go to better positions. So I would say first thing is decide what type of practice you're going to do. Um, I have uh, friends who told me, okay, I, I have half a million dollars between my wife and I, and uh, I want to be in academia. But what do I do with my half a million dollar things? And so he decided to go to to private practice and, and do it that way. You know, it's, everybody's different. Uh, but the idea is if we're going to this track, we're going to want to go for many years. We want to enjoy what we're doing. And so I think that's the more important thing. When, when I finished, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I, I was lucky life put the opportunity there and I grabbed it. But, but I wasn't sure, you know, the same question, what do I do now? I have to start working, what do I do? So I, I would recommend that you start looking much earlier before you finish your residency. What type of entity you're going to be working? What is what I'm interested in? And you start making connections. It's the same as when you're going to med school. No? Same thing, you start connecting with some uh, different people that, that may help you or orient you when, when you are applying to medical school. Same thing with with figuring out what type of practice you're going to have and I started making some connections and finding out, you know, what positions are going to be available, where are you going to live. And there's a big difference between being in a rural area or being in a, in a city. You know, there's all these, all these things. And one thing I want to say about that, because of telemedicine today, which is also something that is revolutionizing the way we do things. In genetics, we are very few. And, and usually we are grouped in urban areas, academic centers. And so what happens with all the patients in, out there? And so telemedicine has come to help us with that so that uh, everybody could work 
from any place, and it doesn't matter. You know, you're connected with a center, and you have a, a consultation you want to do about a particular case, you are able to do that. So it can be very problematic. You can have the patient examined through through telemed, and it's, it's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. So that is also something that is helping us a lot for those who want to be working in a more rural area. Mm -hmm. And are there certain personality types that are best um, to specialize in medical uh, genetics? And um, what tips would you give medical students to match into a competitive uh, genetics program for residency? Well, one good thing about genetics too, today is that it's not that competitive. Why? Because you don't have you know hundreds of, of grad students um, uh, graduating medical school students who want to go into genetics. We are working uh, as, as a profession, and, you know, the association and the academy, we're working to, to show this to not only med schools, we're going to high schools also. And there's a big, uh, the American Society of Human Genetics has a big program that we, we participate to, to go to high schools and talk about this profession. Because I, as I said before, it's a lack of information what it is, correct? People don't, don't know that it exists. So, but if you are interested in, in a career in genetics, the first thing I would recommend is one of your electives. Definitely do it in one of our settings, in one of our clinics, and talk to the geneticists and the genetic counselors who are a big component of our group too. We haven't even touched that, but they, they work with us. And so talk and visit and see how this, this is done. Get an idea. That would be the first thing. Possible to look at different aspects because you know yeah. there's really different sub specializations within it, and so you could go and, and, and get an idea of what it is. Uh, I guarantee you that the people that are looking at this video probably never heard of what genetics is to the majority, I would say. And you, you probably need to find out if that's true because that's kind of the idea that I have. Are there certain personality types that are best to, for becoming a geneticist? Like, it seems like you have to have good communication with like patient interaction and things. Are there any other special qualities? I think that the geneticist has to, um, you know, has to be very patient. <laughs> but, but what you just said is the main thing. Um, if you don't like uh, talking and being involved with people, this is not a specialty. You prefer to be hands-on uh, in the genetics because we really have to deal with a lot of human pain. And so you know, many times you are kind of therapies and by listening and, and helping your patients. So yeah, I think that's the main the main personality component that is essential for, for genetics. Um, and also you have to be curious because there's a lot of um, new information. So you have to be interested in trying to, you know, keep updating yourself and yeah, it takes it takes a, a special interest to do that. So you have to be curious, and you be you have to be a, a little humanistic. Okay, and so with the weight of all like the heavy cases you see and things like that, um, I'm sure it could be emotionally taxing. How do you avoid burnout? Well, that's uh, very important. What I do is my personal life has to be full too. So there has to be time for my family. There has to be time for my own things. I love music, so I spend time doing my music. And you have to have something out of the profession because it can be very, you know, taking it all. And so you always keep uh, your personal life. It's part of what they work because we spend more time here than at home, correct? But I still, I think you still have to make time for those personal things and hobbies and. You know that that make that separate a little bit your work. And that's one of the advantages because we are not such a intensive on-call type of specialty. You know we have a little more time to we sleep in our homes every every night. When I was doing pediatrics, I because of metabolic specialty, many of the kids are in the ICU, and so I did a lot of on-call in kids, and uh, I know what that is. You know for the first 10, 15 years, I did that. And so I know we don't have that in, in, in genetics. So that allows us a little more time at home. Okay. Um, and uh, 
Would you choose the same career path again, or is anything you'd change about it? Oh, I would def definitely. And you know, the most that I uh, I learned and I work in this area, I give my professor back at Sandus in, in New York. I, I I think, oh God, he was really a person put there by God. You know? So because I could have missed all of this, and uh, I'm very happy that I didn't miss it. I, I could be a good pediatric cardiologist, but <laughs> I think I enjoy much more being a pediatrician. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, what tips would you give us to become good doctors? Well, you have to, you have to deal with human pain and disease, and so you just have to be connected with, with your patient. That's, that's the main thing. You have to, you have to be, you know, to be knowledgeable in all this medical stuff, but, but never forget that at the end, you're just a, a human connecting to another one, and, and you're trying to help a person. So I think that's um, what we have, must have, otherwise we should be in business, so we should be in, you know, some other career. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Marjas, for being a part of this interview. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions about becoming a medical geneticist, uh, feel free to leave it down below in the comment section. I can uh, ask Dr. Mardash and get back to you guys. Thank you guys again for watching. Have a great day. Sure.